Praise the Lord. Good evening. Good evening. The little folk that are here right now, put your hands together. Give God a praise offering. This is, first of all, thank you for joining us tonight for this powerful study. This is a powerful study. You do not want to miss it. How I got where I am right now is dealing with a lot of believers who find themselves in the wilderness. We're going to define wilderness for you. We're going to let you know how to get out of there. We're going to let you know what God is doing in the wilderness because our series is entitled, Why Does God Allow Us to Go Into the Wilderness? Young lady said to me, why does it look like I'm always battling? And I wanted to share with her, well, everybody's battling. Mm -hmm. So I want to give you a new insight into understanding what the wilderness experience are for. God does nothing by accident. Amen? God does nothing without a purpose behind it. And God is telling us he's getting ready to do something. Somebody listening to me, if you did not know you were in the wilderness right now, I'm telling you, or you found yourself in a place where you wanted to give up, I'm telling you right now, God is going to show you how to get a blessing in the wilderness. So, part two of this study is entitled, Seeing Your Prosperity in the Wilderness. You got to be able to see your prosperity in order for you to make it in the wilderness. Seeing your prosperity. So before we do anything else, um, go with us in a word of prayer. Then I'll direct you to the text. And we're going to go through and see what God has to say. I'm speaking directly to you. Let somebody know. Your experience, God already knows it. And he's getting ready to take you into an area of blessing because of your diligence to find out what the Word of God is saying. You do know God is a deliverer. So let's pray right now. Let's pray. Father God, tonight we want your direction. We thank you for allowing us to be here. Somebody, their home, their life is falling apart or it's fractured right now. And they have felt like giving up. And we're in this season of where it looks like nothing is going to come together. Or maybe they think their best days are behind them. Let them know, no, you're going to let them see your strategy. Let them see your forethought. Let them see your divine way of bringing us through a wilderness experience and blessing us to a place that our life is going to be better. That's what we're claiming, that this wilderness can't kill me, can't hurt me, can't get me down. I'm going to continue to trust God and believe God for better. That's where we're starting. Amen. So tonight, I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 43. This is a powerful text, and I'll give you the background to the text because this is Bible study meaning you have to study your word. And the text that we're reading tonight is a pivotal text in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43. We're going to read some varied verses, some varied verses from that text. And I want you to follow us as we read. Come on, you need to get excited about one thing. God is going to explain to you what he's doing. I know somebody wants to know, what are you doing, God? How long is this going to last? When am I going to get out? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Isaiah 43, verse 1. Listen. But now, thus saith Jehovah, that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by my name. Thou art mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, the fire shall not burn you. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am Jehovah thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I have given Egypt as thy ransom, and Ethiopia and Seba in thy stead. Since thou hast been precious in my sight, and honorable, and I have loved thee, Therefore will I give men in thy stead and people instead of thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. 
I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone that is called by my name, whom I have created for thy glory, whom I have formed, yea, whom I have made. This text is talking to the children of Israel as a whole. Remember, the children of Israel are Judah, the two tribes, and the ten tribes, Israel. Even though God is talking to Israel as a whole, the ten tribes have already been sold out to Assyria. There is no ten tribes. But here's what God is saying to us. No matter what gets a hold of us, it's never over when we have God on our side. I need somebody to grab that and understand. God is saying, no matter how bad it looks right now, that it's never over because the ten tribes were destroyed. But God is saying that nothing that I created for a purpose can be destroyed and stay destroyed. So even if your mind has been destroyed or your children have been destroyed or your family has been destroyed or your money has been destroyed or, or your direction, your destiny in life, you feel you're not walking in it. It does not mean anything. We have a God, somebody that knows how to put things back together. Somebody need to try put that, write that down right now. God will put it back together. So no matter what it is, God said, when I speak about redemption, when I speak about deliverance, I'm speaking to Israel as a whole. Okay, somebody still didn't get it. I'm saying that whatever you lost, even though God is talking to you here, he's also talking about getting back what you lost. Because that's the kind of God we serve. Don't you ever let a part of your life be over because you don't think God can redeem it. Because God is able to do that. So, I'm going to explain this text to you. So here we are, the children of Israel. Judah now has been in Babylonian captivity. The Babylonians have them. So now God is promising them that he's going to redeem them. He's going to get them out. And he's speaking life into their, into their soul. But here's their situation. They are in the wilderness. They're in that place where they can't feel God's strength. They're in that place where they feel forsaken. They're in that place where they don't know why they're going through so much. A real believer will tell you all of us have been through that, where we've been in a place, been through that, where we've been in a place where we want to ask God why and what is happening. So that's where the Israelites are, Judah are. What's, what's really puzzling also is that while they're there and they've been in bondage, God is talking to them like they haven't been in bondage. Why would God do that? Let me tell you why God doesn't join you in your bondage talk. Because he knows you belong to him. So even though you may think you're in bondage, God never thinks you're in bondage. Because he knows if you ever turn back around to him, he's going to be able to get you out. Listen, somebody's missing it because I feel it in my spirit. What I'm saying is whatever is lost is not lost if God said it's still yours. You got to claim what God said is still yours. Because when God speaks, he doesn't speak like you don't have that energy anymore. He doesn't speak like you don't have that thing you desire anymore. God speaks from a perspective of, I am God, I can help you get it back. So he's talking to the children of Israel while the bondage is going on. He's talking like, because he know I've never left them. So he's speaking to them in a way to let him know that he, he's still blessing them. So they're in bondage. God is talking about bringing them back. You need to know one more thing about the book of Isaiah that will help us in our study. The book of Isaiah, the first 39 chapters, are chapters about God selling them out into slavery of other nations. First 39 chapters. Chapter 40 is a dividing line. That's when God sends comfort to his people. So we're in the portion of the book where God is talking about bringing comfort. Why? Because God brings comfort in the wilderness. Now let's back up and do a review real quick and then let's tackle the prosperity piece. Last week we started with this wilderness experience by telling you what the wilderness is. If you haven't been there, you'll get there. I don't care how much you shout. I don't care how, many, how, how much you know the Lord. I don't care what your title is. You will get to an experience or a season in your life where you're trying to figure out, why am I going through so much? Anybody know what I'm talking about? There'll be a season in your life where things are going to be lost, where things are going to fall apart. There's going to be a season in your life where you're going to find yourself in a place where even serving God 
is not exciting because you're in a season of wilderness, but God is allowing the wilderness for several reasons. We started last week, kind of review, Matthew chapter 4. Remember, the best place to talk about wilderness is Jesus Christ himself. Why would God send his own son in the wilderness? And if God sent his son in the wilderness, why can't we stay in the wilderness? And if Jesus went to the wilderness, he also, in Matthew, left us instructions on how to act in the wilderness. That's why I need to get this, because God has given you instructions on how to act. Look, it's, some, it's not how you act in church. It's not how you act when people are around. How many know the real wilderness experiences come when I'm by myself, when I'm at my house, when the enemy attacks me at midnight, or what I'm carrying around in my mind? The wilderness is not just a place Physically, it's a place spiritually. And I'm trying to tell a saint right now, watch this. Jesus told you what to do. So before anything, Jesus is showing us how to survive the wilderness. You say, Pastor, how long is my wilderness going to be? I wish I knew. But because you have God, the wilderness is still is not as strong as God. Amen? Because you have God on your side, the wilderness is not as strong as God. You are a child of God. Blood wash, filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with his anointing. So if you're going through an experience that has messed up your life, how many know the blessing is, as long as I have God, I have not given up. I've not stopped. I, I haven't gotten to a place where I feel everything is hopeless. Because Jesus was in the wilderness, God left us that example, and he told us the first reason I shared with you last week that he put Jesus in the wilderness was it would help him surrender to his divine calling. Remember that? God helps us with our calling. If you got your notes from last week, he sent Jesus right after he had been baptized. This is my beloved son, whom well pleased. And I share with you, don't think because bad things are happening in your life that God is mad at you. It's not true. God is not mad at you. As a matter of fact, when God deals with you, it's because he's not done with you. God could be in a place where he leads you to yourself. But because you belong to him, he still is taking you through things. How can I say that in a language we'll understand? You don't beat the neighbor's kids. You beat your kids. You don't, you don't, if your kids have done the worst thing in the world, you still hate mama or their daddy, right? So God is saying, the fact that I'm still beating you means that I still love you. The fact that I'm still allowing you to go through this stuff means that I still have something for you. What you're going through in the wilderness is going to help you surrender to your divine calling. And I gave these three points. I want you to write these down again. That'll be a good point. And then you can take off with these points. We found out Jesus was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. Settle that on your note sheet tonight. If I'm in the wilderness, God allow me to be there. That should give you comfort. You're not somewhere God doesn't know. And if you're somewhere God knows, then that means you're getting stronger. Oh, man, this is good. If you're somewhere God knows, that means the devil has a losing battle already. And the proof is you may have had a season of wilderness. Uh, a year. Two years. Ten years. But... If I'm in the wilderness, God placed me there. And if God placed me there, he's right there with me. I'm, I'm going to show you how that's a blessing. Because Jesus knew that. As soon as he was baptized, it said the spirit drove him to the wilderness so he could be tempted of the devil. And while he was there, we looked at the three things the devil tempted us with. And I told you that when God placed Jesus in the wilderness, it was so he could help him walk in his divine calling. Many of you say, I want my... Comfort. I, I want things to be better. Uh, I don't want any pain. I don't want any trouble. I don't want to cry. I don't want any tears. I don't want any problems in my life. I don't want nothing to happen to me or my family. That's unrealistic. What you should say is, I want God to keep me when I cry. I want God to keep me in my pain. I want God to keep me when I can't think straight. I need God to keep me when nothing else is working. And how many know God is a keeping God? And how many know God has kept you in times that you didn't like, but the thing you haven't celebrated is while you were going through that pain, God was right there. 
And even though you were trying to get out, getting out might not have benefited you. Because getting out wouldn't make you surrender to the things God wanted you to surrender to. I gave you three things. Why? God allows you to go. Why God allowed Jesus and he allowed us. First of all, I think I'm going to break them down a little, little lighter than I did last week. The first point I gave you was that we, when we get into the wilderness, we lose the myth that we are self-sufficient. The world tries to teach us we're self-sufficient. The world tries to teach our children they're self-sufficient, which means you can do anything you want. You can take care of yourself. Remember we looked at that? That uh, logically it's saying, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I should be able to take care of myself. And that's what makes us cry because we bought that lie that we can make it in life without Jesus. How many of you know I can't make it in life without my Savior? You were never designed to make it in life without God. But when you start crying about things falling apart, what happens is God is saying, I got to take you to the wilderness so you realize I am your only source. And how do you do it? Look at the first temptation, Matthew 4.4, 4, that Satan said to Jesus. He said, if you be a child of God, stop. The devil loves that. He makes you question who you are in God. He makes you question whether or not God still loves you. Matthew 4, 4 is Jesus' answer. Preceding that, what the devil said. The devil said, if you are a child of God, what he was trying to say is, why did God let you go through this then? If you're a child of God, why are you sick all the time? If you're a child of God, why don't you have no money? If you're a child of God, why is all this happening to you? I see other people that don't know God, they're walking around good. What about you? And Jesus gave the answer to let him know I've already settled so I need to write that down I settled who my source is put that in the chat somebody I settled who my source is when, when a pain comes and when other areas come you've already settled it because Jesus answer in Matthew 4.4 4 was man shall not live by bread bread represents the things in this life that I think I need Bread represents the things, my car, my money, uh, my house, uh, my good popularity, my reputation. He said, you can't live by those things alone. He says, as a matter of fact, all you can live by is every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Did you catch that? He said, why are you sitting there worried about what I don't have or looking around at what's missing? The devil is trying to trick you by making you think those things are your source. Please, somebody write down, that's not my source. It's not your soul. The devil got us tricked. And if I just had all the money in the world, I'd be okay. You wouldn't be. There's a whole lot of people with money in the world. They're not okay. You can have all the money in the world, and if you're in the hospital sick, the money can't do you any good. I always tell people, you can sit around and say, well, we don't have this. If I just had a few more days peace, find your peace in God, not in things. That's the problem. You missed it. Your peace is in God. Now watch this. Jesus said, no. Now watch this. 40 days he had fasted. He was hungry. But he said, I'm not being tricked by my flesh desiring what I don't have. Because I know if I get tricked, I'll act like those things can help me when I got the one thing I do need. And that's the word of God. Somebody write it down. Look, look, look. Oh, I wish I could get to somebody and let them see this. Everything else that you feel you're missing is nothing when you, you decide that the word of God is your source. Because then we can go back to Matthew 6, 33, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And how many things? All other things. I didn't say all things you desire. I didn't say all the things you think you want. I said all the things you need, God will supply. So I told you, the first thing we got to realize, Jesus failed to figure this out. If I'm going to get my calling, God was teaching me in the wilderness, I got to quit even getting upset because I don't have the things in this world I think I need. The second point, I'll break it down a little bit. I told you the second thing was we are partners with God in the gospel. Write it down. God wants partners, not people who just want power. God, I'll take that down again so you can write it down. God wants partners, not people who just want power. What do you mean by that? Because the enemy knows if I can get you to become the kind of saint that all you do is run around and ask God for stuff, then you've, you've missed the boat 
that when God saved us, he joined us to his family. Now we're a partner with God. We can walk in all the power of God. But we can't ask God for power so that we can shine and so we can look over someone else or not help other people out. When we're a partner with God, we're partners in building his kingdom. Are y'all with me? When you're a partner with God, you're a partner in building his kingdom. But if you get your mind only on what you want, you've lost your partnership. Because you spend all your days figuring out how to get your stuff. And all you do is pray about your stuff. And God has said, man, they missed the boat. If they would just partner with me. And listen to me, I'm not talking about works now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Somebody said, well, I work for the Lord now. This is not about works. This is about your heart. This is about whether your heart you knows God is number one in your life. And you'll partner with God. To partner with God means I'm going to listen to God other than my flesh, other people, or anyone else. So here's what happened. Jesus, Matthew 4 and 7. Devil came to Jesus, second temptation. Tested. He said, look, cast yourself down. And God said he'd get his angels charge over you. So cast yourself down. And Jesus answered, no, devil, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The word tempt means test. Here's what he's saying. God's not on trial. If you're testing God, you're not testing God because you don't think God is worthy. You're testing God because you're greedy. Follow me. Here's what he said. Tell God, because that's what the, you know, all of the prosperity preachers tell you to pray for, you know, that if you, if you, if you got enough faith, you can get anything in life. So you focus all your life on trying to get everything instead of working for God. And when you work for God, everything will come. I can tell you right now, I got some folk in this room that will tell you, I may not have all the stuff I desire to have, but won't God feed you, clothe you, give you some peace, help you sleep at night when all kind of pain is going on. I know people right now who got everything and can't even sleep at night. But we have, we can have, we can be in all kind of sickness, we can be broke, we can got bill collectors, and we can still lay our head down and say, Jesus, help me go to sleep tonight. And God will give us a supernatural sleep. Now, I'm only talking to the folks who ever been broke. I know some of my folks listen to me, y'all rich and stuff. But I've been there where I didn't have the money to pay my bills. But you know what I had to stand on? The word of God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I was able to stand on God. I'm telling somebody right now, I stand on God. Man, get that look to yourself. You can stand on God no matter what else is happening in your life. I'm being truthful with you. I'm not taking you to this supernatural, miracle working stuff because God is a miracle worker. But only when we realize we partnership. Jesus said, quit testing God by saying, God, give me this, give me that, give me that. Because you're testing God for stuff you want, not so you can be a partner with God. Because if you weren't, you could be like Paul. Two-thirds of the New Testament. What was one of the words he stood on? I've learned to be content, no matter what state I'm in. Please don't bypass that. That's one of the most powerful statements because most people are antsy and jumping around because they haven't learned to be content. So the last temptation was probably the worst one, Matthew 4 and 10. He came, the devil came to him and said, took him up to the top of the world, showed him all of that. Here's what he says. Here's the devil's last ditch effort. I will give you everything if you worship me. Now, what he was saying is, if you, if you embarrass God, the one who brought you this far, and fall down and start worshiping me. If you get to the point that your trials in life are so bad that you know, you've forgotten who it is that brought you this far, he said, if you worship me, I'll give you all the power you need in the world. And there's a lot of folk, you know, you heard stories about selling out to the devil. A lot of folk have sold out to the devil for something temporal that doesn't last. The reality is, guys, if you're broke and content and you got God on your side, you got more than a person with a house full of money. Because broke and contentment is more blessed than having a whole lot of money and confusion. Watch me for a minute. So, so, what, so let's say, first, if, if, if me and Marsha's bank account look good, I'm happy. When it don't look good, I'm happy because I got another bank account. I'm not trying to be funny. I put my, this is what we stand on. Somehow, anybody with me? Somehow, my God will make a way. Somebody know, somehow, 
God's going to make a way. Anybody, anybody got a testimony that you can look back over your life, even though it was something you were half out of your mind about, didn't God make a way anyhow and get you through that situation? Somehow, God let me bear up. It was hard. It hurt. I cried. But God helped me bear up anyhow. Because that's the kind of God we serve. Why? Because the enemy wants us to worship. Look what Jesus said. I like what he said first. He didn't just say, you, you should only worship the Lord thy God. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Write that down. Here's the key. You got to kick Satan out once and for all. You got to let him know. When you come knocking on this door, I've already settled already that you're going to get there. What you're saying is foolishness compared to how my God has treated me. Oh, uh, you don't know the midnight hours my God brought me through. You don't know the days when I was half nuts and the Lord gave me sanity right in the middle of my craziness. You don't know the times that God carried me when I couldn't carry myself. You don't know the moments when I woke up in the middle of the night, had the weight of the world on my shoulder, but I had God to talk to. Anybody hear me? That's the only, that's the only comfort we have, which takes us to not only is the wilderness where you walk in your calling, because that's what Jesus did, but the second thing I told you is the wilderness is for prosperity. I want to show you now how God takes the wilderness experience and makes your life prosper. It's in the text that we read, but we're going to stick to just verses 18 and 19 for a moment. Look at verses 18 and 19 and listen to the promise God gave. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. I'm going to show you what God does. He puts you in the wilderness, not only so you can walk in your calling, I'm walking in my calling, but secondly, so he can prosper you while you're in the wilderness. Because if you learn, my God, how to prosper in the wilderness, you can prosper when you're out of the wilderness. But if you never learn to prosper in the wilderness, you'll think the prosperity is you and not God. you got to learn how to give God the glory. Look at verse 18 and 19, Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, I want you to follow me. This is Bible study. Come on, grab your Bible, grab your phone. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. You shall know it. Here's the verse I want you to see. I will even make a way in the wilderness. When you think you're at your last, that's when I'm making a way. He said, and, 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 and the way this verse is written, God not just makes way. Look, God's people were in bondage. Okay, y'all went back and I said, God's people were in bondage. But while they were in bondage, he kept them. He blessed them. We can go back and look. When God's people were in bondage, he raised them up. Look what he did for Joseph. He raised Joseph up even when he was in prison, even when he was going through the worst part of his wilderness experience. God gave him prosperity and always looked out for him. There's somebody listening to me tonight, somebody sitting here that will tell you, at the moment, I don't know when, I don't know how God knew it, but God knows how to show up at the right moment and give me what I need. God can make you prosper on a job when you don't have the education. God will make you prosper in, with, a, with a banker. He'll give, some, give you favor with a banker. He'll give you favor uh, when you're just going downtown to the store. He'll give you favor when you're going to purchase something. God will keep you even though it looks like you're on the deficit end. As long as you have God, you're really on top. Well, I like that. Y'all give me some ideas to preach. Write that down. I'm really on top. I want somebody to cry last night to write that down. I'm really on top. I'm really on top. And if, your, and if your mind tries to tell you you're not, remember, I'm really on top. Why? Because God said, when I created you, I made you the head and not the tail. If you want to be the tail, it's because you think you are the tail. So the wilderness gives you a blessing. How do I know? I was uh, riding home from church two nights ago. And tired, so I was thinking about the ride. Um, getting home and doing something else. And the car in front of me just slowed down and stopped abruptly. So I had to stop. And, you know, you start thinking, you get a little angry or something. But then I looked, when he stopped, I looked and saw the skunk that was walking across the road. And I started thinking to myself, I know that man didn't want to hit that skunk and have his car all skunked up with spray. So I'm thinking there, and then it hit me. I don't know if you ever thought about this. But I'm riding down the road, I started thinking, why in the world would God make a skunk? What good is a skunk? Think about that. I don't want to get sprayed if, if, if funky stuff up. 
You walk around, when you see a skunk, I don't know if you know this or not, a skunk can spray up to 20 feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 20 feet away. Why would God make somebody with that kind of weapon? Mm -hmm. I started thinking, God, there is possibly no reason for a skunk to exist. Mm -hmm. Let alone walk in front of my car. But I went back and I did some research. You are shocked. You tell you about a skunk. I didn't know this. Skunks are the best benefits to maintaining the environment because skunks eat insects and animals that other people can't eat. Other animals can't eat, won't eat. He eats stink bugs. He eats wasp. He eats mouse. Wow. He eats gophers. Uh, it says that the skunk eats moles that's in your yard. So if a skunk come in your yard and because other animals are smart enough to know they don't want to be around a skunk. Listen to me. I found out that the skunk does not have a lot of natural predators. Meaning that other animals are scared of wolves are scared of skunk. If you got a skunk in your yard and a wolf trying to get in there, the wolf gonna leave because the skunk is dead. But the skunk leads to protecting our environment. He protects your gardens. He takes those little, little bugs that eat your crops. Skunks eat those little bugs up. Who would have thought that there's a reason for a skunk? Well, by God, who would have thought there's a reason for all this pain I'm in? Who would have thought there's a reason for my wilderness experience? I'm sitting there thinking about my wilderness just like I'm thinking about that skunk. I don't want to be broke. I don't want to go through this stuff. I don't want my children to have to suffer. I don't want my wife to have to suffer. I don't want to go through days and nights where I don't know what's going on. But there's a purpose for the wilderness just like there's a purpose for the skunk. And it's right here in this text. God is going to show us that that skunk not only prospers us. Watch what the wilderness does. It's a blessing. Go back to the first verse of 40. Go back to the chapter again. In this chapter, God, I want you to write these verses down. I'm going to share with you. He tells the children of Israel, he reassures them, I'm reassuring you what God said, even though you're in the wilderness, I need you to know something that's going on in your life. He says about seven or eight times, I am the only God. I'm going to give you the verses. I want you to write them down because it's important. In verse 3 of chapter 43, write down verse 3. He says, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. He said, I want you to remember something. No matter how bad it's getting, I am your God. You are my child. I'm your Savior. Verse 10. I am He. No God was for me for me, and there will be none after me. He said, child, I want you to know why you're going through this. There is no other God but me. Stay with me. Verse 10. This is all God. What God is telling us is he's giving the Israelites, even though in the wilderness, he's telling them his credentials. He's telling them how powerful he is so you don't lose it while you're in the wilderness. Verse 11. I am the Lord. There is no Savior but me. Perk up. Smile where you are. I know you're there. I got you. I'm going to bring you what you desire. Verse 12. I alone declare, save, and proclaim. I am God. Don't worry, I proclaim the things that I need to happen. Since you're a child of God, watch me somebody, start proclaiming the things you want in your life and not complaining about the things that are not happening. I got people right now that could be blessed, but you start talking about all the things you don't have because in the natural you don't see them. Why don't you spend your days proclaiming what you, the things you desire so God can give you the things you desire? Because my natural mind tells me that that's not going to happen. That's why it's not going to happen. Because you're letting your mind tell you and not the God who says I'm the only God there is. Look at verse 13. I am he alone. I act and can reverse it. Can somebody underline that? God can reverse what you're going through. Hallelujah. That means God can restore, get back. Whatever you lost. Somebody needs to start claiming the things they desire. Somebody say, well, I'm too old, or it's too far gone, or I lost it. So you're trying to tell me you think that it's too far gone for God to reverse it? No. That's why he's giving you his testimony of who he is. He said, I can reverse. Man, it's been too long. I was telling someone they had an illness, and when I prayed for him, 
They were puzzled because when I prayed, I said, and now let God touch every bone, the muscle, the tissues, the blood that he created and put them back together. Since he created them, watch this, he can recreate them. Why can't he? Only person, he can't if your mind is limited, but he can recreate what he needs to recreate. Watch this. And then in verse 15, I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel. I'm your king. Verse 25, I am he who sweep your transgressions for my own sake. I remember your sins no more. God said, not only that, but just in case while you were in the wilderness you sinned, I don't even remember those. I'm going to bless you. Why the wilderness? Because we need a fresh start. Look at verse 1 of chapter 43, and let's look at the first thing God said he gives. We're going to do two things tonight. God's going to show you how God gives you a fresh start. And I'm going to show you how God makes all things new. Write those two things down. Yep, we got about 20 minutes to knock that off. So let me tell you. Verse 1 of chapter 43. Follow me, get your Bible. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob. Stop. Look at that first verse again. God said, but now. Whenever you see a conjunction, but now, it means it's opposite of what preceded. Right? So if there's a but, I gotta go back and see why God is saying, but now. That means God said, I'm getting ready to do something different. This is what was, but now I'm getting ready to change it. So if you go back to chapter 42, come on. You want to, you want to go to Bible study? Go to chapter 42 and look at the last verse of chapter 42. It'll bless you. This is what God was telling the children of Israel. Verse 25. Therefore he hath poured out his fury and his anger and, his, and the strength of the battle. And has set him on the fire round about him. Yet him, yet he knew not, and it burned him, yet he laid it not to the heart. If I were to start up uh, further in verse 23, because I want y'all to understand, who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for this time to come? Who gave Jacob for spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not I the Lord, he against whom you have sinned? For they would not walk in my ways, neither were they obedient to the law. Therefore, he had poured out his anger. Here's what God said. Up to this chapter in your life, up to this point, you've been in the wilderness. And I allowed you to be there. I was the one who gave Jacob for spoil. I'm the one who sold out Jacob. I'm the one who actually was the person who let robbers rob Israel. I'm the one who put you in bondage. But now, Somebody say now. now. Go back to the verse. You, you got to get a now spirit. You got to quit thinking about what used to be and say, this is what I am now. Sometimes we'll get so messed up. Somebody will start talking to us and we'll start talking about something that happened last week, acting like that's still us. If God took you from last week to this week, quit claiming last week's stuff and start saying, but now this is where I am. Somebody better start claiming, now I'm getting better. Now, God is making me better. Now, God is raising it up. Now, when I go back to the doctor, the doctor won't find anything. Now, God will heal me. Now, God will give me the strength to walk in this illness. Now, God will tell me what I need to do. But now, God says, look, if I'm going to fix you, you got to go with me with some but now. you got to say, God, that used to be, but now, this is what I believe. Amen. you got to get there. Because he said, look, I said, he said, but now, thus saith the Lord that did what? I created. I didn't create you so you could go through hard times and I'm your father. Who do you think you are? You think you want to treat your child better than me? It gets even better. He said, I created you, O Jacob, and formed thee, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. Listen to that. He said, I created you, Jacob, trickster, but you had a heart to love me. So, since I created you, I was able to change your name because I can take anybody, Amen. no matter where they are, and make them better. Amen. He said, I'm the one, Israel, who formed you. Here's what he's saying. Fear not. Fear has torment. 
He said, the main reason you can't be new, because once fear gets a hold of you, once the devil allows you to walk in fear, that means you've lost the understanding that God is getting ready to do a new thing. Somebody ought to write down, God's going to do something new. I'm proclaiming tonight, the prosperity God has given you is he's going to do something new in your life, which means he can reverse what went on, he can bring you to a new place, he can recreate you, he can use you where you are. You just got to start celebrating what God said he's going to do. How do I know that? Here's the best one. In that verse. Whenever the worst tears come in your life, you ought to say what God said right there. I have called you by my name. By your name. Listen to me. If that don't turn you on, I don't know what will. Here's what God's saying. I know you. I call your name. When you're laying up calling my name, I'm calling your name back. I know you. you I know your name. I walk with you. I know what you need. So since I know you, I called you by your name. Do you know what God is saying? Every now and then, if I'm going through, you, start, you need to start listening for God calling your name. Just as bad as you're calling on him, he's calling your name. He's saying, James, I got you. I know it's bad, but I got you. Matt, I got you. John, I got you. Vinny, I got you. Do you hear me? I'm calling you. You don't think that's something when God knows your name? When God's up in heaven, with all that he knows, he's sitting there calling your name because you're in the wilderness. Trying to help you because he knows your name. And then he said, I will take you and do a new thing. Don't count me out. I will restore. I want you to write down Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30. You can read this later. I'm going to glimpse over some of it. But Deuteronomy 30. We're still talking about a fresh start, right? What God is saying, but now you're going to get your fresh start. You're going to start some stuff over again. Claim your fresh start. But in Deuteronomy 30, it's the children of Israel. God is a, a prophecy of what's going to happen when the children of Israel get out of bondage. Look at what God said he's going to do. And the only reason I'm saying that is the way you know God is going to give you a fresh start. Because he already prophesied he was going to give you a fresh start. Everything in the Bible tells you God already said what he's going to do in your life. Look at it. He said, then the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 30, verse 3. I'm going to read a few verses. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. Somebody, God is speaking to us now saying, no matter where we've been in our wilderness, he's going to bring us back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors, and you will take possession of what is yours. He will, here's the prosperity, he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. The Lord God will circumcise your heart and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and with all that you live. And if you go down to verse 10, if you obey Lord God, keep his commandments and decrees, he will do this. Listen, I just wanted you to know, you're not asking God, wow, for something he didn't already promise you. When you ask God for what you think you're asking him, and you think you're asking him for a lot, he says, you're not, you're not really asking me for something I didn't promise. So if you're asking me for help, I promised you help. If you're asking me uh, for stability, I promise you I can help you get stable. If you're asking me to restore you, I promise I could restore you. There's many people in here, you don't understand restoration, because restoration, people think, means that um, there's this great thing uh, that I get to this big one act where God just turns everything around. That's not restoration. That's a miracle of where God restores. But restoration is when on Tuesday you felt like giving up, but on Thursday you're praying again. You've been restored. On Saturday, all hell broke out, and you cried all day, and you felt everything was hopeless. Watch this. The situation didn't change, but you got closer to God, and now you got more strength than you ever had. That's restoration. Somebody needs to understand. Restoration, come on, you've been there where all of us have been here. I know, I know the bravest saint, the toughest saint will tell you they have not, but there's been times when I'm like, I don't care what your title, apostle, bishop, saint, pastor, whoever you are, the warfare can get so tight that you felt like giving up. You may not say it out of your mouth, 
But there's been time in your life the warfare was so tight that you felt so boxed in, you didn't know what was going on. That's one of them God moments when God had to help us through it. But if you have any kind of saint that's been serving God, you know what I'm talking about. So God is saying, don't count me out. Depend on your butt now because I created you, I redeemed you, I called you by my name. The Bible promises us a fresh start. The last book of the Bible, almost the last, the last verse, it's the last chapter of the Bible. Look at what God said. Write down Revelation 21.5. Now, this is after we went through all sealed judgments, all of the symbolism in Revelation, new heaven, new earth. You notice those symbolisms, right? New heaven, new earth. God always make new stuff. New heaven, new earth coming. Here's what God said in Revelations 21, verse 5. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He said, write these words. For these words, right, for these words are faithful and true. God said, the one thing you can depend on is I will give you a fresh start and I can make things new. So what you're sitting there upset about in your wilderness is not the end of your journey. God said, I can make it new again. And, and so you don't know God's talking about pie in the sky. Look at Lamentations 3.22. Lamentations 3.22. Because of the Lord's great love, somebody can write this testimony, we are not consumed. Because God loves us, we have not gone under. He said, for his compassions never fail. What are they? Lamentation 3.22, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Somebody check that. I will wait on God. That's how you get prosperous in the wilderness. You let yourself release and tell God, I'm going to wait on you. How do I know that? Because David was in the wilderness when Samuel came to pick a king. David was the last person they thought should be king. But God said, I like God. Do you have any more sons than these big strong ones? You know what God is saying? It's like God said, um, these are good people. They're great. But you got somebody out there in the wilderness, a little frail looking something that I can strengthen? You realize that when God chose us, he looked over all those other folk. Hmm. And then he said, no, I want, I'm going to jump on that one. Because here's what God does. God said, I have plans for David's life. So when you look at it, David became a new person. He got a fresh start and his brothers did not. Hmm. Somebody claimed your fresh start. And... Then the last thing this verse tells us is he makes us brand new. Look at verse 19. I'm telling you to read verse 18 and 19. Look at verse 19. It, it's a blessing. It's a blessing when God said, I will do a new thing. It shall spring forth. I messed up. I messed up. I missed a word. One of the most important words in that line. He said, behold. Hmm. That's what I've been trying to get to all night. Behold. The word means see. Nothing I'm saying up here will do anything but make you happy until you start seeing it with your eyes, faith. If you don't see it, it's not going to happen. God is saying, I'm getting ready to do something new, but you got to behold it. If you don't ever talk about it, if you don't ever pray about it, if you don't ever reinforce it, if you don't cast down imaginations when the enemy's in your mind, if you don't try to walk differently, if you don't have to try to read scripture that's going to reinforce your position, if you don't try to get me closer, then everything you heard will do nothing until you say, I see it and I'm going after it and I believe God has it for me. I can see things changing. 
I see it. Not with my natural eye, but I believe if I stay on this course, even in the wilderness, God will change it. How do I know? Because God said, I will make a way even in the wilderness. That's all I'm trying to get you to see. Your best prosperity comes when you're in the wilderness, but you're looking for that blessing and not focusing on the wilderness. He said, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to make rivers in the desert. What's the most important thing in the desert you need? Water. God said, I'm getting ready to refresh your life. So I better grab that. God is going to turn things around and he's going to bless your life because God does new things in the desert. He said, Pastor, how do I grab it? I'm glad you asked. Behold. Remember, remember the title of this is you got to see your prosperity. Uh, if you don't see it and I do, I'll prosper and you won't. So I said, how I survived that long? Because I did. I was just talking to someone today. There was a mother who got sick, 1989. Four healthy kids. All of them dead but one. And mom's still alive. That's not a good thing because she buried her children. But the good thing is, she kept, when, when asked her, how do you survive, you know, with all your kids going? She said, I trust God. That's all I can do. I trust God. Alternative is, don't trust God and live a miserable life. But when you trust God, it means I'm beholding what God has for me. Colossians 3, 9 to 11. You got to write this down because this is your homework. This is the one that's going to get you on the path of getting your prosperity in the wilderness. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9 through 11. When you get down, read this because this is the action verse. This is the verse that will help you put Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 into practice. Oh, look what he said. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on your new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. There is no Gentile Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, or there barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and is in all. What this verse is telling you to do the simplest thing. When you find yourself tonight being consumed with negative thoughts, where if you look at your life and it still looks the same after this teaching, then you got to put off the old man and put on a new man that's been renewed in some new knowledge. You got to let the new you answer your trial. Don't let the old you, oh you scared. Oh you have been through, oh you're gonna fail too many times. You need that new you. And how you make the new you? You take off the old self, put on a new self. And what is that new self? It's renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Guys, we live in a way that we have a God who nothing can deter, nothing can stop God from blessing me and bringing me out of this situation. Quit speaking limited stuff. Quit talking about how bad it is and start telling yourself, God will give me a new thing, give me a fresh start, even in the wilderness. I praise God. You don't want to miss this last installment next week. We looked at the divine calling in the wilderness. We looked at how God gives us prosperity in the wilderness. Next week, we're going to come to the point of how to get out of the wilderness before you go too far. How do I get out of the wilderness? We'll look at how to get out, out of the wilderness next week. These first two uh, tech, uh, in, uh, installments have been talking about why God did it, but also God is telling us, I'm going to make a way out. I'm going to show you how to get out of the wilderness. All right? God bless you. Those of you that joined us, don't forget, go to Shiloh Baptist, www.shilohbaptistchurches, and there you can leave your offer, and we appreciate it. If you go on our website, you can look at some of the great work that Shiloh is doing. All of you that joined us, leave something in the chat. 
We'll make sure someone will get in touch with you. But I want you to do this. Everybody who got blessed tonight, if you know you're in a wilderness situation, understand something. You need to start seeing God doing something new in your wilderness. <clears throat> God bless you. Have a great night.